Welcome everyone. We have Rodney, Brian, Corvin, and Jan, and myself, Michael. We were talking about POE, but we can shift over to hypervisors. Uh, Corvin, as a developer, do you have anything you want to report or need help testing? No, not yet. Okay, we are standing by. Uh, Rodney and Brian do interject if you have something, but Jan, you have been tied up. Do you have something new to report with your amazing projects? Um, I don't know if I would call them amazing, but I tested uh, Alexander Martin's patches. So uh, on 14, I couldn't reproduce the uh, VitIO SCSI um, complications. But uh, having read his patches, it looks like um, it wasn't just that the uh, user space interface to the come uh, target layer uh, truncated the text from 64-bit to 32-bit, but also that it didn't trust user space to generate proper text and replaced them with its own uh, counter. Uh, so uh, it didn't even pass the text correctly along between the uh, device node and the innards of the cum target layer. And uh, now he added some patches to 14 current to generate proper text in the user space uh, tooling for it. So CTL admin mostly and trusts uh, Beehive to be responsible for producing valid um, tech for the tech commands. And it worked. And it worked. And Beehive does produce correct uh, tags? Yeah, uh, that, well, it, it's upon the guest kernel to generate, to allocate the tags. And if it doesn't work with VidIO SCSI, it wouldn't work with any other uh, real SCSI controller. So yeah, if you have a proper guest kernel, it works. And just don't run anything with a broken, too badly broken SCSI uh, initiator. Well, yeah. Okay, cool. Oh, and but that's universal. That's not Beehive specific. Right. And the other thing is that the um, process uh, manager and supervisor I'm using, S6 and S6 as he recently released an update. I haven't found the time to uh, bump the port yet. Uh, but um, the latest release finally adds support for multi-instance service definition. So that I could have a generic Beehive service definition and then uh, run multiple instances of this dynamically. And I don't have to template out all the service uh, definitions for every guest, which will really help with keeping the Ansible playbook runtime uh, within reasonable uh, limits without writing my own Ansible module or using some kind of hacks like Metagen, which break with every Ansible update because it sticks to deep in the inlets of Ansible. Um, so yeah, once I have found the time to integrate all this, uh, it should be in a state where I can inflict it on someone else. <laughs> Understood, that's very cool. So upstream has made your job easier? Yes. Uh, <laughs> my pleadings have been <laughs> taken into account. And I wasn't the only one who said, well, it's this is a really useful feature to have multiple instances of a service, which only differ by name. And then the startup script know to look things up under this name, like the guest name in the case of Beehive. What uh, more traditional services would benefit from that? Uh, web server for example OpenVPN. okay uh, where you uh, and it's already implemented in the freebsd rc.d scripts the open vpn rc.d script uh, in the comments says just symlink this once per tunnel uh if you want to manage them for example if you want to run them under different users with a startup script or something and the rc.d script uh, handles this uh, the S6 mechanism is a bit more powerful and complex, but uh, it's because it actually handles all the recursive uh, supervision of this, these uh, subservices. So, um, yeah. Very cool. 
it's quite useful, but anything else to report? Uh, not from my end. Understood. I do not have anything new beyond my recent topics of uh, experimenting with the NextCloud AIO virtual machine that has Docker baked into it. So it does want to be under Linux. NextCloud? Uh, yes, they have the AIO all-in-one, which is Docker-based, but there is a company in Sweden shipping a, a virtual machine image that can be extracted, okay. converted to raw, spun up. They default to a terabyte disk image, which is a little inconvenient, but they well, do above average best practices. And I've, I have a, a Google Doc linked in the previous minutes that okay. uh, explains all that. Go ahead. I was confused by the um, abbreviation AIO because I assumed it expanded to asynchronous AIO and not all in one. Correct. Yes. Uh, and I think I was the wondering... Macintosh AIO definition rather than uh, rather than the yeah. So I've dropped the link in the chat uh, for because, my uh, write up. The web dev uh, service is written with Saber Dev in PHP and could really use some. Uh, Improved I.O. handling. Oh, I see. <laughs> Different A.I.O. Yeah, and even on good hardware, it maxes out around 50 to 60 megabytes a second for uploads and like one point something gigabits per second for downloads, even on a 10 gig link. And it's just limited by inefficient single threaded code per transfer. I see. Uh, which is plenty fast for most users, but uh, if you use it to transfer large files uh, for customers or something to host some deliverable, mm -hmm. uh, then it's a bit annoying waiting to upload a 20 gig uh, Photoshop uh, document or something. I see. So my hope was to use Deb Bootstrap, the Debian bootstrapping tool under FreeBSD and Compat Linux. And oh. Daniel kindly pointed me in the right direction on quite a few things, such that I'd prefer craft my environment and only at the very last moment launch it under Beehive, ideally root on on uh, 9P um, if possible. But go ahead. Just a few questions. Of course. And you can peruse that doc at your leisure. So um, you're running their um, Debian-based virtual machine in Beehive. Correct. And there's the document. And that's how you want to run it in production, or do you want to migrate it out of this virtual machine image into a, a Linux-branded jail? Uh, so a gentleman named Gibran kindly looked at doing that, but there are so many system D hooks that that might not happen in our lifetimes. But there are a few options available if you want to minimize what's running uh, under um, the hypervisor. Um, Mixcloud can use um, S3 compatible storage. So you could run your um, MinIO or something on uh, the FreeBSD host and tell Nextcloud this is your um, um, storage backend. Don't use the local file system. Use some kind of object store as file storage. Uh, if they let you, you could point them at your own Postgres or MySQL service and it's really important to have a Redis service as well for a medium to large scale next cloud deployment because otherwise they fall back to using the um, SQL database for recursive file locking and uh, that really doesn't scale because post, neither Postgres nor MySQL are designed as distributed locking services and Redis is a lot faster for this so and you can also use the Redis as a PHP uh, code cache so that you don't have to run anything else, which also helps with um, load times. 
So you're thinking split out as many of the services uh, as where possible. Redis has a single, um, doesn't have a double D. Double D? Uh, Redis doesn't oh, isn't oh, sorry. spelled with two Ds. Oh, thank you. There you go. Thank you for that. Uh, Glad you're watching along. And the other last thing is that if you move it out into some kind of uh, S3 compatible storage service, you can snapshot that on the host outside of. Are you running Nextcloud? Yes, but I should really upgrade it. Okay. Yes, you should. It's, um, it's not the next the next few weeks or so. It will go end of the release I'm running will go end of life, and I have to look into running and migrating it to PHP eight and stuff like this. Did you possibly use like the Raspberry Pi image, or I think it was maybe three? No, I'm running Raspberry it Pi on image that went away. CBSD jail uh, natively. I see. Uh, and I missed the point to just follow along the port. So now I have to find the least painful way to do a step-by-step -step upgrade path along the releases. I see. Because I'm too far back to migrate in place and it's annoying. My motivation is to use the Collabora interactive office suite that can replace the document you're staring at. And it's been working okay k for a spreadsheet for time mm -hmm. tracking so i do want to dog food that so that's my motivation google has enough of my data already <laughs> are there any other next cloud or other appliance users on the call in recent meetings we've identified basically some top wish list appliances to run such as the ubiquity unify controller which i believe is java based it is and isn't there a port for that as well you could just uh, run it natively that's, that's a very good question uh, it is or at least they used to be i don't know if it's still maintained properly but because it's java based someone had to do the porting ones but it shouldn't be too hard to keep running I will the annoying thing is that they're Ubiquity using MongoDB right. and so on, but. I'm on fresh ports and do, 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 do. just look for Unify uh, because it has a bunch of dependencies. I would make sure to uh, put it in a jail, potentially a VNet enabled one, um, because it may want to bind to some ports or all addresses or something for the auto discovery part. Okay, uh, there is indeed, I'll um, drop, drop in the chat here, I'm trying to be a good boy. There is the Unify 7 controller. I hope that is that's, from that's our That should lifetime. be uh, the okay. production release. Okay. Thank you for that bit of information. Then there was, let me perhaps peruse the minutes. There was another appliance or two in mind. Um, and often the com a question has come up about, about say, QCOW2 support. And I know that the UPB team has uh, some code in motion relating to that. Well, but if a vendor provides- The question is, image, what do you want to do with it? Might well, a vendor might provide a management VM and say, you can't like convert this to rock or else you throw your warranty out the window. So silly things um, like that. In that case, you will probably also lose it by running on an unsupported hypervisor. <laughs> Be nice. Okay, so, maybe. No, it's annoying, but really you have to run it on some blessed hypervisor as well. That could be, but... Uh, um, we'll pick because, our battles individually. Um, there are multiple tools to convert a Q code to a raw in uh, the FreeBSD ports tree. 
Correct. They may be bundled with the QEMO uh, tools, but compared to uh, a hypervisor, their footprint is small. Actually, there is a QEMU utils, I believe, which is handy. Okay. So you can have that a la carte, uh, QEMU. And then you could just create a Zvol uh, with a correct block size, of uh, caching, and compression, and point B have added. And off you go. Yeah, I swear, I think it was you. QEMU utils, but anyway, um, or maybe it was v, maybe VBox utils. Um, yeah, VBox has its own tools for it. QEMU has its tools, and yep. probably several, at least encoders. I don't know about decoders. Correct. But a lot of the Q code two features aren't really desirable if you have ZFS because you don't want to have another uh, snapshotting and of course, of course, compression yeah. layer. Um, somewhat related, I'm curious if anyone has ever insanely tried the Microsoft VHD conversion utility under Wine so that, say, FreeBSD release engineering could produce a VHD X image rather than just VHD. I don't know what tools are currently using for the VHD, but um, but those are seemingly generational such that uh, if you want like UEFI boot, you need a VHDX image. I didn't have the inclination to uh, look for anything at Azure or something like that. I cannot blame you, but um, it's a thing. Although I've I actually I found it surprisingly useful testing ZFS under Windows. When things go wrong, it's very handy to bring the storage, uh, the import the pool under a FreeBSD VM, set it straight, and then try again with Windows. So I did have a use case, although a type one old VHD uh, generation is just fine. So there's that. Rodney, do you have anything hypervisor related to share or questions or desires? Yeah, I do have a update on my, can we boot a Linux and a FreeBSD off the same ZFS volume? And I have successfully found that FreeBSD can in fact mount Proxmox's ZFS Apple and do a ZFS send of the the um, Proxmox root, which is PVE-1 onto a FreeBSD ZFS and be still intact. So progress has moved a little bit there. I actually, I actually now have Proxmox and FreeBSD on one ZFS volume. Can't boot the Proxmox yet, but the FreeBSD still boots. Got it. So you've placed it in a boot environment? No, I didn't because that would I would have to go into FreeBSD and say this is a boot environment. Is basically I took the, it. If you look at Proxmox, when Proxmox does a ZFS install, it creates a root that is pool name slash capital root slash PVE dash one. Yep. Instead of calling the root default, which is what FreeBSD calls its root. So it's actually already got a separate name. I have sent that data set into a data set on FreeBSD. I didn't put it in the root data sets yet. I just wanted okay. to confirm that I could actually I could actually send this over and then go look at it and and poke around at all the files in BSD. I actually forgot to reset its mount point. Oh, um, you overlaid it. So when I so when I rebooted about halfway through the FreeBSD boot, it suddenly overlaid my root file system with Proxmoxes, and I got a uh, what was the error? Um, uh, unrecognized executable or something like that. It didn't yeah. like it, it. It first, I think the first one was it couldn't create slash dev slash null. Um, hmm. 
And then later, oh, exec format error. That's what it blew up with. It finally blew up with an exec for it tried to exec Proxmox's date on FreeBSD, and that blew up the RCT scripts. It would have been even like, funnier if you had uh, the Linux uh, 64 kernel module loaded. Exactly. Because then the kernel might have gotten a terrifying amount for mm, No, because it wasn't the kernel that caused the barf. It was the fact that we tried to exec Proxmox's date command. But the kernel compatibility could allow it to exact, run. Exact, exact, oh, no, exact, uh, format. Okay. Oh, exact format error. I don't. Um, yeah, that's oh, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah what yeah, the kernel that, says if it doesn't support VABI. Yep. Okay. And if yeah, you have that might. Linux, yeah, all right. I'll do it. I'll just, it. It's, it's trivial to do. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not because you also have to set up the linker and so on so that the runtime linker works and so on. But if you replaced it all, the defaults it is, it of is, your Linux runtime linker may have been compatible with the mount points visible at that time to actually get you to a state where it suddenly falls over because some system call isn't fully compatible. Or well, the more interesting thing would, would, would be to bring to add the Linux later to my FreeBSD environment and then go poke around in PVE and see how many of the binaries in there I can run. That's yeah, trivial to do. Date should work. Huh? Date should work. <laughs> yeah, date should work. Um, system D yeah, maybe date. not so much. <laughs> but interesting. Well, I don't think Proxmox uses System D, does it? Oh, I thought it's stock Debian, but I could be wrong. Okay. So anyway, what so path forward do you have for the actual boot? Well, this they have a a uh, I've copied the EFI partition as well. So they have okay. a bootloader in EFI. So I probably can merge the two boots at, at the EFI layer because we have, a, we have an EFI loader, a copy of loader that runs in EFI. They have a loader that runs in EFI. So that's just a matter of EFI boot selection. But uh, if you're trying all of this under Beehive, you will find out. No, I'm not. This is, I'm running on native hardware. EFI variables. I'm the running on native hardware. Okay. Of course, not trying this under Beehive. Even <laughs> the idea of running Proxmox under Beehive would be that's, that's trying to nest. Yeah, and that's it trying to nest. Because... Be. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> yeah, there will not be nesting in anytime soon. So, such is life. Got it. The that opposite cool. may work. I believe Proxmox supports nesting. Uh, yes, it's st st uh, stock KVM. So yes. Yeah. You enable it. It's possible. All okay. The, uh, performance and security implications. <laughs> yes, of course, that. Jan. But this is cool science. So, yeah. yeah the, 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 young, the, none of that matters, Jan. I'm running on dedicated hardware in a deconnected environment. Uh, <sighs> one of the things which this could be used for would be a modern day deep pingerinator for dedicated uh, servers at cheap hosters. There you go. Okay, so Rodney, Godspeed, document your work. Uh, <laughs> changing gears, Mark, welcome. Are you the Mark that's working with Andrew? Yes, Mark G. Mark G, Mark G welcome. Uh, hey, uh, what you working on? What you got? <laughs> uh, um, so, I think the last time I spoke was Vagrant Zone stuff, working with yes. Vagrant and Beehive and getting different zones. Um, I've done quality of life things. I haven't done a lot of work with it because here at Promenade, we are working on Domino-related migrations, and we're actually using Vagrant Zone to spin up the VMs, and we're using it in production now. Um, so it's getting its runs through. It's running. It's getting it run through through a, I guess, dedicated team temporarily. So. Um, it's 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 pretty stable. Um, there are a few features I always want to keep adding to it. It's a never-ending project. But uh, um, is there a public repo that might matter to those present? And those uh, does anybody if anybody uses Vagrant to spin up zones, it might be helpful. But there aren't many Packer templates for it. You might have to make your own um, because no one else uses Vagrant and and Beehive 
because no one has a plugin to do that until I made this. So uh, well, that's a chicken and egg problem. So yeah, keep it coming. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> yep. Yeah, I, I got the tool to build it. Uh, and I also have, uh, uh, this, uh, I guess the standards of the zone box files, like the, the structure defined. So it, it's all out there. I just need to get you a link. Cool. Thank you. And all of the builds I've recently been working on getting it regression testing, uh, some CI CD actions and GitHub actions and trying to make sure that it's, it's targeted for Omni OS right now. Um, sure. it will be, That's I am cool. going to be, I'm still going to be trying to get to working on the BSDs as soon as I can. Um, but I need to, uh, target work stuff first. So. That's the lowest beehive specific or could this be used on FreeBSD as well? Uh, I want to make it to where it works well in both OmniOS and free and, and FreeBSD. As long as it can run Beehive, I want to be able to run this. I want. I want. Sorry. I, if 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 the machine can run Beehive, I want to be able to run Baker Zones to spin up Baker machines on top of it. But uh, right now, it is very heavily targeted to OmniOS. I I do a lot of OmniOS specific checks in it right now that I would need to probably generalize for BSD. Well, at least you're running checks. <laughs> yeah. It's mostly like, are we running VirtualBox? Oh, you shouldn't be running that at the same time as this. I'm going to quit because you shouldn't be doing that. Sure. <laughs> Very cool. Um, you have missed some of the recent discussions of like wish list items and although Andrew has been a fantastic participant and very active, uh, do you personally have anything you'd love to see in the coming year and just be at pet peeves, be it exciting new thoughts. I mean, with ZADM and them implementing web console that solved my access to the machines issues. I just wish, um, wish, wish, um, windows performance, I think is still a bit of a mystery on the right settings for any, like what are the magic settings to make windows scream on a beehive machine? That that's 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 what I'm that's what I'm looking for this year. It's my shopping Got list. It. Very cool. The clock uh, drivers under development should help with that. Repeat that, Jan. The uh, hyper the power virtualized clock driver should help with that, which is under development. Indeed, and Vitaly has been sort of yeah getting and my nudges. The other off thing for the is, very reason. from the mailing list posts, I vaguely remember that the. NVMe uh, storage backend is the best choice for Windows. Um, supposedly, it's faster and doesn't require uh, extra drivers to be uh, installed during installation at just the right point in time to use VIDIO uh, block devices. Mm. Uh, I don't know. Uh, so, and there have been random performance problems with different VIDIO and drivers because there are different versions signed by different parties. You have a Red Hat one, there's uh, other ones as well, and supposedly it's a pain in the posterior. But uh, NVMe, at least for a FreeBSD host, should just work out of the box with UEFI and Windows. So you don't have to pre-insert the Vertio drivers. Exactly. That's great. Um, no, not use MVP and, and all the other first tools. installation, you may want to use the E1K emulation for, for the exact same reason as well. Uh, for have which? You said the disk or network? I'm sorry. E1000, uh, I think. The Ethernet emulation. Oh, for Ethernet. Uh, so that you have network access to push in uh, the, um, the VetIO uh, net drivers. But someone would have to measure if it's even worth doing. Uh, save CPU cycles or improve throughput by a measurable amount. Getting that 10 gig on Windows does look pretty appealing using Vertio. Um, so, but like you're saying, E1000 yeah, still has its benefits. The problem with 10 gig and at least Beehive on FreeBSD is that the FreeBSD Beehive VidIO net emulation is only a single queue per direction and almost none of the optional offloading features that IO net could use. So the guest kernel drivers in FreeBSD may make use of multi-queue with IO net interfaces offered by hypervisors, but the Beehive implementation is fairly simple. Uh, 
if you want to throw lots of CPU cycles at it, you could probably define some kind of round robin trunk of uh, multiple interfaces or something, but don't try that with Windows. And it only helps you if you have enough connections to distribute your load over. We are and using link aggregation. So, so in our yes. current in Prominent, we're currently using OmniOS with link aggregation on 10 gigs oh. on 10 gig controllers to two exactly. so different switches. So we're doing it at the crossbow level, but not necessarily at using multiple NICs on the it behind be themselves. A, it would be a horrible rock around. Uh, but it should work because you get one pair of queues per uh, interface. Uh, that's one way to build a multi-queue uh, network to make use of more than a single queue. I confess uh, I'd never bridge. considered that. Fascinating. Uh, I, I did it uh, in my routed network because it maxes out at like, depending on packet size, six to 15 gigabits, depending on the uh, packet size mix I'm trying per interface. And it's basically limited by four directions, but it's limited by the single thread throughput on the network side. Uh, so getting single uh, connection, 10 gigabit throughput and we have take some kind of PCI Express pass through on FreeBSD right now. So if you have the right network card, which has enough uh, resources to pass out to uh, guests and you're comfortable messing with your drivers at runtime when restarting guests and so on and pinning down the guest memory, you actually can get uh, good throughput with multiple queues. But oftentimes you're limited to something like 63 or something queues per at least per direction on a card. And if you want to hand out four or eight per virtual machine, uh, you will quickly run out of uh, queues to pass through via uh, PCI Express pass through. Hmm. Uh, maybe someone with a um, better network card can get it farther. But if you have an old box in your lab like I did, um, then with a single queue on an old Intel 10 gig NIC, you're limited to like six to eight gigs of throughput. It doesn't take a whole lot of CPU, but you're limited again by the number of queues to how many guests you can run and you can put in a lot more memory than queues on a cheap old Intel dual pot 10 gig card. That's what I found out okay. really hard way. But you're probably on server hardware. Is SRIOV within reach? Such uh, that I believe you can get the problem is that, interfaces per per NIC. Go ahead. Yeah, but the card I had didn't, didn't okay. support that many uh, virtual functions. So, Mark, so, uh, do, do you have SRIOV within reach? I haven't actually done too much with SRIOV. I have done PCI pass through, but since we're doing everything, since we haven't, I haven't tried passing through. I mean, I haven't needed to pass through devices, so I didn't ha okay. haven't really considered much of that, to be honest. Uh, well, I think the SRIOV I used for the what what was the predecessor of the X five. Uh, 120, uh, the one with a long numeric name from Intel. Mm. One generation earlier, and that okay. was limited to a few dozen queues. And so I badly had to pick how many queues per virtual functions to allocate. Yeah. I could create enough virtual functions, but I didn't have enough queues to distribute among the virtual functions. Got it. Uh, but this was a old to you dual socket Xeon server running at two point something gigahertz. So the problem was that I okay. had plenty of hardware threads, just not very fast ones. Thank you, Jan. So could push through this limitation with higher single thread throughput up to okay. the point. That said, I dropped in, uh, Mark, for your benefit, the uh, Clara article from Jim Salter about uh, the amazing uh, NVMe emulation. Thank you, Chuck, for that. For that, it's and one of the few fully compliant implementations and emulations. <laughs> Go ahead, Jan. <laughs> and another uh, 
thing to watch out for is that few FreeBSD at least uh, network drivers are properly uh, are properly tested for dynamic reconfiguration. So mm -hmm. uh, expect some uh, corner cases and over time regressions. Okay, if you've got examples, share them. Uh, the i three fifty quad port uh, one gigabit cards I had some problem. I had to write a like free line patch to do do basically in the guest driver to look at the card, enumerate it, attach a driver, find out that it's not in the right initial state, and do a second uh, function level reset, and then the registers on the state and the driver can continue. Yeah. Basically three lines in a retry loop so that it can attach on after the guest has already booted once. So the first time everything would work and then the guest restarts, the driver would say, oh, uh, the hardware isn't in the uh, expected setup state. Uh, I'm not touching it. When passed through? When passed through. Okay. Uh, and as one under, interface or all four as the whole card? Uh, I don't each, know if it'll show up as Interface individual. on those cards is a full PCI Express physical function. So, so you did each, one of four to a VM, correct? No, no, no uh, I did a virtual function on one, I think. Oh, I see. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, or I passed through one of each. Uh, either would have worked for me. Uh, but okay. uh, the having to power cycle the whole host chassis via IPMI to reboot a guest uh, didn't sit right with me. <laughs> That's not ideal. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Mark, anything else to share? Nope. I think I spoke my wish list and gave them updates. I don't really have much. Um, Appreciated. I don't know if there's anything Andrew wanted to follow up on. He didn't tell me. So. Okay. Cool. No problem. I yeah. uh, hope he's doing fine. He's been a Amazingly loyal attendee. Jury duty this week. Oh boy, fun, fun, fun. Yeah. Uh, Brian, do you have anything to share or ask? Nothing at the moment. Understood. So we're at 40 minutes in. Um, don't think we'll revisit POE like we were discussing before the chat, but um, Rodney got speed on that dual booting and I hadn't considered EFI as an angle there. And note that there are uh, some, several user land UEFI utilities for be it configuring, be it for deleting all those annoying previous entries. Like, oh, Ubuntu will be forever on your laptop as a boot option despite um, the OS being long gone. Go ahead. Be careful erasing unknown EFI variables. Okay. Uh, for yeah. example, MSI had a series of uh, workstation laptops. We are deleting some random variable. Just by deleting all EFI variables would really brick the device to a point that you had to arm a the motherboard. Okay. Because it wouldn't even touch any disk. Uh, it, you couldn't, barely, you had to, not even a full EFI reset did it because without this variable, which you couldn't put in place with the EFI interface again, you basically had to rewrite uh, the uh, EFI nor flash. Goodness. Okay. Um, other hot topics. And for those who have been infrequently joining, I've been recording the production user meetings and posting them to the BeehiveCon YouTube channel. And remarkably, last week, last time, I got the video up the same day. Can you post that link in chat? I don't think I've actually gotten oh, that link. Absolutely. Uh, and it's fortunately relatively simple, and it even came up from autocomplete. Here I we probably have actually visited. I think you did. I think you did your last presentation. I probably watched something there in that last time. Yeah, the trick is just throw the at symbol into yeah, the URL to get. Um, and I don't know why the December first meeting was so popular, but I see two hundred fifty-two views, which I'll take it. Huh. Anyhow, so there's that.
Um, oh, did I think to put it on the minutes there? Probably not. Uh, do, 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 do. Uh, minutes, minutes. Okay, I'll put it at the top there. Production. Users, if I can sell production, right? Easy. Production users uh, call recording. So there's that. Okay. Anything else or do we all get back to work? And for what it's worth, uh, Dan has been slow to close the BSD can call for participation such that if you want to propose something, it might still slip in past the deadline. Well, okay, gang, I'm happy to call the official meeting and I will be around a little bit if you want to catch up on anything. And I thank you very, very much. I'll call it 944 a.m. Pacific. Sorry that I came in late. And then hopefully, you, again, once to get these migrations done, I'll be able to, to join more often. It's just, Andrew's so, he has his time slot like eked out every week, but every week I have a meeting that's scheduled like, 20 minutes, 30 minutes right before, after this, and I need to prepare for it sometimes. And it's just, uh, yeah, I want to. You so. are forgiven. And that's part of the reason for the recordings is that if you want to just turbo through one, go for it and catch up. So you have a Yeah, I like anything. that. Awesome. Well, thank you, everyone. Bye. Take care, have everyone. a good one. Bye.